with everyone, this is Mr. Brass, and today I'll be talking about the construction of morals and utilitarianism. A Nihilist's job would be to describe our moral consciousness to find sets of principles that have practical consequences and applications. Morality is accepted to be created and not discovered, and we have to decide on moral views to adopt. It must be noted in a system of morality that a reason agents find many things immoral is because of the imperative that says we shouldn't treat people merely as means. But however, this is an absolute and it can conflict with the principle of utility, aka maximizing the good, as sometimes in order to maximize the good, you have to treat people as a means to an end. A system of morality has to be somewhat constraining in order to make sure people are behaving in such a way that is conductive with society and it functions as a way to counter man's selfish nature, along with help them compete with beasts. Hobbes went into the social contract theory, which shows how society creates laws to control selfish people and to bind them with cooperation. Hume pointed out that justice is an artificial value and a negative one at that. Justice exists because malice people exist, and if they didn't exist, there would be no need for laws of justice. A more natural form of Protagoras societal system can be put into place, i.e. adios, for moral sentiments and respect for obligations and dyke, which cover the formal rules and political rules for law. These constraints assured the flourishing of human well-being and a more utilitarianism approach is put into place. There are many views of utilitarianism like act utilitarianism for example, which says an action has a choice between actions and that the right act is what produce most happiness for everyone. This has problems as it doesn't make clear why we should exclude any creature that feels pain, whether this applies to those whom are currently alive or who might be alive later on and whether we should prefer a large population of moderately happy people and a small population of very happy people. Is it totality of happiness that matters or is it the average? Also, is it even possible to measure pleasure and pain. It cognitively doesn't make sense as well because when you distribute happiness in a person, you generally have a person who would rather have a period of misery followed by happiness instead of vice versa, even though the pain and pleasure is equal. As, as proponents like Mills realized, aka that such utilitarianism would be impractical as even within a small population, it's too much to expect efforts of all members to be directed towards promoting well-being of all, and it becomes more probable as you increase the size. Another form of utilitarianism is rule utilitarianism, which makes general happiness indirectly the criterion for right action. Basically, one deduces things that give probable effect of happiness. This has been criticized for saying it ultimately reduces to act utilitarianism, but this can be avoided if rules aren't treated as purely abstract entities. Mills tried to make his mind up about two basic theses. One, that proof and reasoning generally apply to me means but not ultimate ends, such as the we can't prove health is good, but we can use it as an end, and that even for an ultimate end, something like proof can be given, i.e. by determining the right judgment based on considerations. No reason can be given why the general happiness is desirable except that each person desires his own happiness. This, however, being a fact, we have not only all the proof which the emits of, but all of which is possible to require that happiness is a good, that each person's happiness is a good to that person, and the general happiness, therefore, a good to the aggregate of all persons. With the following, with the first, it fails simply because aggregates of persons is not a possible object of desires, and it isn't a possible subject of the experience of the satisfaction. Mill's idea can't transition from individualistic hedonism to the universalistic level. He makes the word happiness soulless, as it isn't a direct condition, but rather just a name for what everyone wants. As J.L. Mackey points out, as I have said, the general happiness is not purely authoritative or self-justifying starting point for moral reasoning. As a nihilist, I can say that there isn't anything to pretending our moral choices are constrained into ways that they never should be, but rather that we should build a moral system of the first order to promote whatever it is we value. This doesn't mean that an individual is free to invent a moral system at will, but merely that it must be adopted socially by a group of people for interaction with one another. Every group has fragments of moral systems which contradict each other, and people can merely put pressure on the fragments to achieve a goal that they desire. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. <laughs>